Good morning. Good morning, Rabotai. Welcome to Breakfast in the Class. Breakfast in the Class today is, is uh, dedicated, excuse me, in Zichut Rufuash Lema for Haim Tzadok Ben Miriam, who unfortunately needs a, a, a speedy Rufuash Lema. And as well, um, in honor of Netanel and Shoshana uh, Aminov, my uh, daughter and son in law, who moved to Eretz Israel yesterday to begin a life of Torah and mitzvot. Uh, and Be'ezrat Hashem, there'll be Zohar to make us to make us all proud. Uh, we're giving this class as a shout out to them and and uh, as a zechut to them. Okay, the week of Kolbru is dedicated in loving memory of Sami Sayed. Lev Shalom, the Yehudi Nishmat Shalom woman Rivka, sponsored by his son Isaac Sayed. <clears throat> There's a very interesting uh, progression in the Pesukim of the Torah, and I just wanted to mention this for the sake of looking at an interesting uh, out, outcropping of a, of a specific pasuk and how the pasuk develops our understanding even just from the placement of a pasuk. We started talking a little bit about this the other day and uh, I want to kind of look a little bit deeper into it. The pasuk tells us that um, Aharon, Aharon HaKohen, he, he, had a, uh, he had a korban to bring and he brings a korban which is for himself, his own personal korban. Then the pasuk tells us that Aharon, he needs to change out of his clothing that has gold in it, his eight uh, character, his eight clothing uh, uh, choices with the Kohen Gadol wears, because they have gold in it. And that reminds God of the golden calf. So, in kategor naase sanego, you can't have a prosecuting attorney become a defense attorney. If something reminds Bore Olam, so to speak, of a negative thing, you don't use that thing when you're trying to ask Hashem on Yom Kippur for Kapara for everybody. So therefore, what do we do? We take off the clothing of gold and he changes into clothing made only out of white, only linen, only clean, only pure, representing Kapara. Then the Pasuk says, and it tells us about the korban that Aharon brings on behalf of the Jewish people. And the Shem Ishmuel asks a very interesting question. Why would you tell me about korban number one, then tell me about Aharon's clothes, then tell me about korban number two? Surely, just tell me about the clothing choices of the Kohen Gadol in the beginning, or tell me about the clothing choices or, or obligations at the end, and put the korbanot together. Why are we interjecting Aharon's clothing on the holiday, what he was obligated to wear from the Torah, why would we put that in right in the middle of the two korbanot? So the Shem Yishmuel gives a very interesting answer, a technical answer, an answer that tells us a lot about how the Torah operates, but also gives us a wonderful lesson for the lives that we lead. Baruch Atah this class has also should be as an ilui neshama lezechen nishmat Moshe ben Yona Moshe Siri ben Yona Ruach Adonai Tenichenu Begam Eden So the answer he gives is as follows He says there's two types of teshuva that the Gemara talks about One type of teshuva is mohalim lo al kol avonotav they forgive him for all of his sins. Another expression in the Gemara says, very, very similar, with one slight difference, slight nuance. It doesn't say that a person who does teshuvah, mohalim lo, it says, pokekin lo. Pokekin lo means we stop it up, like putting a, a stopper, pkak, in a bottle. You put the, the bottle stopper in there, it can't spill out. So his sins are, so to speak, bottled up. They don't escape. So which is it? Mochalim lo? Do we forgive him? Or do we say pokekim lo? We stop it up. It can't escape. Well, a second level of that question really is, what's the difference? If I asked you, just on a literary level, what's the difference? What would you imagine is the difference between these two things? What might you say? What's the difference between forgiving someone their sins or stopping up their sins? Not letting them escape from the bottle. Sorry? So in one, the sins are still there. 
It's just a matter of the, you know, it's like as an example, imagine you had the most poisonous substance known to man. Would you want to destroy it or capture it in a bottle? Well, destroy it. Because God forbid, what happens if the top gets taken off? What happens if your kid's playing with the bottle? Shatters on the ground. It goes everywhere. Mochalin lo or pokekin lo? Which is it? And the Mifarashim, the commentators explain that there's a big difference between forgiving and forgetting. Between erasing something and just kind of kicking the can down the road. Saying, you know what? You're safe for now. <laughs> and who wants to hear that? You know what the answer is? The way, the process, the level of forgiveness on God's side is commensurate to the level of Teshuvah done on our side. How deeply do you regret? How badly do you want to do differently, be different? How much have you changed your ways? You understand? So if the change is, so to speak, shithi, it's surface level, so then the forgiveness is also surface level. We can get along, you and I, but you know what? I'm never going to trust you. I'm never going to rely on you. I'm never going to really engage with you. I'm never going to be vulnerable with you because I, I hold in remembrance exactly what you did to me, how you acted, what you said. Okay? If that's the case, then we understand something very deep over here. Aharon, he sinned with the calf, with the golden calf. He didn't do the sin of the people. His intentions were 100% pure. All he was trying to do was make sure that he was buying time until Moshe Rabbeinu came back down the mountain. He knew that the second Moshe came back, the problem would go away. So all he needed to do was stall. So Aaron's like, yeah, sure, bring me all the gold. 100% golden calf, you got it, coming right up. Aaron's like a contractor, right? They tell you it's going to be done on Tuesday. When is it done? Two years from Tuesday. And then when you come to the guy, you say, you said Tuesday. He said, isn't it Tuesday today? <laughs> Are we clear? So this concept, my friends, the idea of Aharon's noble intentions means that Aharon actually is still on the hook. Because through him, something terrible happened. You know, a person could be tried for murder in court, or they could be tried for accessory to murder. They could be charged for grand larceny or accessory to grand larceny. Many times, we ourselves are not doing the sin, but we enabled the person to do the sin. We didn't get in their way. We didn't stop them. We didn't tell them not to be better. We didn't convince them, you know, to not do that chilul Hashem. So Aharon, there was still a debt to be paid. But my friends, Aharon paid that debt with change. Aaron lost his two sons. Aaron paid the price. He did the teshuvah. He did, so to speak, whatever the crime was on his level. But boy, did he do the time. So says the Shem Ishmuel, in the first korban, is the korban of Aaron's, it's for himself. So the pasuk doesn't tell us that Aaron needs to change. You know why? Because for Aaron's owned korban, he and God were good. The gold that Aharon wears brings up no bad memories, brings up no sins, no punishment, no worries. But then the pasuk tells us about the korban that Aharon is going to bring for all of the people. And that korban, if you look in the pasukim, says the Shem Ishmuel, is not only for Aharon to bring, on behalf of the people, it's for every single Kohen Gadol throughout history to bring. So while Aharon and God were good, was every future Kohen Gadol also going to be good with God? Now the Gemara tells us that every punishment that the Jewish people suffer throughout all of Jewish history, it carries with it an element a, a, a modicum of punishment for the golden calf. And the reason for that is because the betrayal of the golden calf, when we could put something else as more important than God, every sin that we do carries a drop of that. When we don't do the right thing, what are we saying? We're saying, my desire in my eyes 
is more important to me than God and his mitzvot. My trip to wherever is more important to me than God's commandment of Shabbat. My desire to go out with my friends to this restaurant is more important to me than God's commandment of kosher. So in every sin, there's a little remnant of the original Jewish sin, the first Jewish sin, which was the sin of the golden calf. And therefore, in every punishment, there's a little bit of the sin of the golden calf uh, uh, getting, getting paid for. My friends, so for Aharon, Aharon was squared. But for every other Kohen Gadol, until the time of Mashiach, it's not done. We're not done. So every Kohen Gadol cannot wear the golden clothes. So therefore the Pasuk puts it, after Aharon's personal sacrifice, because he was good, in between that sacrifice and the sacrifice he brings on behalf of the people that every Kohen Gadol would bring. That sounds like a lesson that I should be learning with Aharon HaKohen. Why am I teaching it to you? Anyone hear his name, Aharon HaKohen? Nobody. You know what the answer is? This idea, the duality of life that exists within people is so important to remember. You as an individual is not the only hat that you wear. There are times when you want to do something and for you to do it would be no problem. But there's an issue. You're not only you, you're also wearing the hat of a father. And while what you are doing may be technically okay, according to halakha, it's very complicated. If you do it exactly like this, if you say it exactly like that, if you behave exactly this way, it's kosher. But your child is not wise enough, is not uh, mature enough, is not discerning enough to understand how you danced between the raindrops. So what will your child learn from your actions? He might learn something that maybe you wouldn't have wanted him to learn. So sometimes you're acting not only as an individual, as an Aaron Kohen personally, you're remembering what will future Kohen Gadol's think if this is how I do it. So even if for me it's not necessary, it might be necessary for everybody else. My friends, sometimes we forget that we don't only wear our own hat, we also wear the hat called the Jewish people hat. When you complain in an airport loudly, screaming, cursing at the, uh, the, the woman behind the check-in desk, what do people look at? What do they see? They don't see an individual. They see the Jews. Amazing. I have this my whole life. You're wearing the kippah, someone walk up, walks up to you, they ask you, what is Israel doing in Gaza? I was like, hold on, let me ask. Bibi, Mako Hisham. Bibi tells me, <laughs> what do you want from my life? All Jews, all Israelis are one person. They represent one thought process. They stand for one thing. And we don't realize a lot of times that even though on a personal level, I'm completely okay saying, doing, acting in a specific way. But remember, you don't only represent your own individual self, you also represent the larger role that you play as a Jew. You don't only represent yourself, you also represent, you are also a father. You're also a husband. You're also, maybe in my case, a rabbi. Every religious Jew that I've ever seen, who's ever done anything wrong. What's the first thing that people say? If the guy is not honest in business dealings, this, that, guy will tell you, guy, crook, and he's religious. <laughs> religious people are people too. Religious people have yet to haratu. Is the reason why he committed the crime because he was religious? No. Could you imagine, I go over to someone, I'm like, you know what, this guy, he did a crime. And you know, he's not religious. He doesn't represent all, but people see people that way. So the Pasuk says, Aaron, you're good. But you know what, other people looking at you, they might not be good. So I want you to behave 
in a different way for the sake of others. And you should be clean in the eyes of God and in the eyes of men, in the eyes of humanity. So, I want to ask and challenge, I want to ask and challenge uh, you today, because there's always the words that were whispered, uh, you know, that kind of always are whispered in my ear whenever I think about this, when I talk about this. So a guy who tells me, he goes, you know, whenever I drive, I don't put on my kippah. Why? Drives like an animal. Cuts people off left, right, and center. Right? And everyone that sees him, what do they say? Look at this guy. This is a religious guy. Cutting everybody off. Maximo. That, you know, they're all, they're all cursing at him. He says, so therefore, when I drive, since I drive like an animal, I take off my kippah. I was like, why don't you leave your kippah on and not drive like an animal? <laughs> Has that thought not entered your, your... Is that possibility not on the table? Yeah? Sometimes people think to themselves, you know what, I'll take off my kippah, I won't show who I am, and then I don't need to worry about it. But actually, that's not. I think in some measure, the reason why we were mitakin this concept of a yarmulke, of a kippah, yarmulke stands for yare me'eloka, someone who fears God. The idea is that you remember always that there's something or someone above you. This concept of wearing a kippah, identifying yourself as Jewish everywhere you go. Everyone might, that's a dangerous exercise. You know, what if you don't act the way you should? That's the point. So that you have to act the way you should. When you're walking around and you're wearing a uniform of a police officer, you got to keep the law. Why do we make our police officers wear the uniform? So that whenever they're going everywhere, they keep the law. Obviously, there are some people who are undercover. That's a whole different story. But in general... My friends, step up to the plate. You are yourselves, but you're also a Jew. You should be identified as such. Like the Pasuk says, V'ra'u kol and the people of the world will see, Ki shem Hashem nikra alecha, v'yare'u mimeka. The people will see that the name of God is called on you, and they will fear you. They will, now that word, v'yare'u, we have that same word, ish, Imo ve'aviv tirau. A man, his mother and his father, he should fear. Do we want our children to be afraid of us? No. The word yir'ah is a nuanced word. It doesn't only mean fear. It also means awe, reverence, respect. That's what it means, respect. Yare means you're in awe of. You revere your parents. When the people see, when they see that the name of God is on you, they fear you. Right? It doesn't mean fear, it means they appreciate, they respect. A man once told me when I was on a plane, I was walking past, he said, Please go in front of me. I said, No, it's fine, you go. He goes, No, no, go in front of me. I said, No, no, it's okay. He goes, My father always taught me. If ever you two should meet a Jew, you should show them respect. They are the people of the book. They live their life by the way God intends they should live their life. They are a messenger and a light unto us all. Please go before me. And I thought to myself, where can I get a 3D printer to print billions of copies of this guy and release them on the streets of the world? Could you imagine if that's how the world thought? Never mind the fact that Jews would get treated better. Forget that for a second. That's a side bonus. Imagine if people respected people that did the right thing. Imagine if that's what the world held up. Not a celebrity, not a football star or a basketball player, not, but someone who does the right thing, who lives their life by a creed, by a code. I want to end with one story. <clears throat> there was a... Uh, a woman who unfortunately had a very terrible disease on her scalp. It was very dangerous, and it was very rare to find a surgeon that was able to produce or provide the surgery that she needed for her scalp. They finally found the surgeon, but he had a waiting list from here until kingdom come. 
They begged, they pleaded, they this, they that. Please, if there's any time, if there's any way. <clears throat> Finally, the doctor said, listen, I have a way to squeeze you in. But the only way I could do a surgery is if she gets this medicated shampoo. You have to go get this medicated shampoo. She needs to put on the shampoo um, before the surgery. If she doesn't have the shampoo that she could put on before the surgery, I can't provide, I can't provide you with the surgery. Okay. They go down to the uh, to do the the to the play, to the hospital, and with all the craziness, they check in the night before. With all the craziness, they suddenly realize they forgot to buy the shampoo. The surgery is first thing in the morning. If they lose this slot, the next time will be who knows how long. He's desperate; he can't believe it. He says to his wife, "He says, let me run out and see if there's any place that's." still open, it's almost, I don't know, 10 o'clock at night. He runs out of the hospital, runs, close, 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 close. He finally finds one store and the man is literally pulling down the metal gate. He says, please, he says, we're closed, sir. The guy says, you don't understand. We traveled here from another city. My wife is in the hospital. She's supposed to get surgery tomorrow morning. The only way he could do the surgery is if she has this special shampoo. Please, there's gotta be some way, there's gotta be something you could do. If I wait until the morning, it will be too late. The man says, you know what? Okay. He says, but I've closed the register. I can't, I can't actually charge you for the shampoo. The man says, I'll come back tomorrow morning as soon as the surgery is done and I'll pay you. The guy sees this man. He's almost crying. He seems very sincere. He thinks to himself, if, you know, if he was a thief, this is a very specific thing to ask for. <laughs> you know, he doesn't ask of anything else. He just wants only this thing, you know. Anyway, he shouts out to the guy in the back. He says, can you get, to get him the shampoo? He says he'll come and pay tomorrow. Anyway, okay. They get the shampoo. He hands it to the guy. He says, thank you. He says, I'll be here tomorrow morning. He runs off into the night. He gets the shampoo. They put it in the first thing in the morning. She showers with the shampoo. She has the surgery. Baruch Hashem, all goes well. The wife is coming out of recovery. She goes to sleep. The husband has a few minutes uh, where he, she's not going to be awake. She's uh, still sleeping off the effects of the drugs from the surgery. He runs back to, this, to the same uh, pharmacy. And he walks in the door. The door rings. And as soon as he walks in, he hears a, a, all the voices, all the people in the pharmacy going, Yes! Oh, shucks! Oh, no! Can't believe it! Everyone's screaming. He doesn't know what the heck is going on. He walks up. He's got the money in his hand. He says, what is this? What's happening? He says, we all took a bet in the pharmacy. Whether or not you actually want to come back and, and pay up. A guy comes. We tell you it's not in the register. He says, at the time when I gave it to you, I wrote it off. I figured, you know what? Worst case scenario, I'll pay it from my own, you know, my own pocket. It's not that expensive. I'll pay it. But when I told the guys, some of the guys said, that, so we started a betting pool. And half of the guys, some of the guys betted on you coming and paying. And some of the guys bet. And not only that, when people in the other branches of the pharmacy found out, we have a massive betting pool on whether or not shampoo guy, hashtag shampoo guy, is coming back to pay for it. So that's why a lot of the people were very happy. And some of the people were, were not so happy. All of a sudden, some guy walks out from the back and he goes, hey, not fair. He says, what, what, what do you mean? The guy says to the man running the till who gave him the shampoo, he says, not fair. I bet against him. I bet he wasn't coming back. But you didn't tell us he was Jewish. If I would have known he was Jewish, I would have bet that he was going to come and pay. Shema Israel. What's the difference between a person who looks at a Jew and says, of course, if he's Jewish, he's going to come pay. And a person who looks at a Jew and says, of course, if he's a Jew, he's a crook. You know what the difference is? Which Jews they met. Did they meet you and you drove like an animal? Did they meet you as that Jewish family that the first thing they do when they get in the airport is try and figure out how they cut the line? I was just waiting online in the airport at a very long line. Maybe we were online for two and a half hours. Ten times people said, Rabbi, come, we'll put you in the front. Come, come around, come around. I said, I'm a rabbi. 
What is every person thinking as I walk around the front to check in? These Jews, they think they're better than everybody else. These religious Jews, they'll take any opportunity they can to, to screw over somebody else and put themselves at the front of the line. You have to remember, my friends, you have to remember your role. I had a family member at the front of the line. You know what he said to me? He said, come with us. We're already in the front of the line. We already waited. Just come with the suitcases. Tell everyone you're with us. I said, that works for me as an individual. It doesn't work for me as a rabbi. Shlomo maybe was online with you, proxy. Rabbi wasn't online with you. Rabbi needs to wait in the back. When I give classes in people's houses, they'll tell me, Rabbi, why are you helping to clean up? I, please, you're embarrassing me. Put the things down. I said, because I'm a rabbi, I should be less of a mensch? You have to remember the roles you play. You have to remember that when you're a father or when you're a mother, you're your children's rabbi in Rebetzin. They are learning from you. So even if you're okay with it, what are they learning? Do they understand the difference between this and this? There's an interesting law called Marit Ain. That means that if you're doing something that looks like it's wrong, even if it's not actually wrong, it's still Asur. Did you know that? Marit Ain. Why? Vihitem Nikiim. You should be clean in the eyes of God and in the eyes of men. And if someone else is looking at you, and not in today's generation, where you say, I couldn't care less, you do you. No. You do you means that someone else learned from you the wrong thing. And that's not how a Jew is supposed to behave. That's not how a human being is supposed to behave. May Hashem bless us with the moral fiber and the courageous attitude to always know how to do what's right and to push ourselves to be a light unto the nations. But before we're a light unto the nations, a light unto our own communities, a light unto our own families, a light to our own children. Be'ezat Hashem, we should be zocheh to the beracha that comes from being that light. Baruch Adonai Le'olam.